One of the things I loved in your documentary, The uh, the Coming War in China. Brad, can we go to uh, The Coming War uh, with China? You have had, and still have, an arc of of bases that start in Australia and go through the Pacific. We have no bases in Australia. You have Pine Gap, you have Darwin, and you have a new facility in Western Australia. No, uh, to speak precisely, we, we have no military bases in Australia. What we do is uh, operate with and in Australian bases. Yeah. But we're not in the basing business nowadays. Not in the basing business. It's an extraordinary collection of what are referred to as lily pad bases. Mm. Um, these are bases that have typically two, 300 troops, um, no family members, very few amenities, and are often quite secretive. They're bases that are frequently constructed within a foreign country's base to disguise it, um, and, and generally are not referred to as bases. Many of these bases have been set up to combat China's worldwide economic influence. From these bases, the United States operates a secret army in 147 countries. If you're going to be a free country rather than give in to every gangster regime in the world, you're going to have to take a risk because those gangsters, they want to, they, they want to eliminate good people in the world so they can, uh, uh, and, and in China, they want to dominate all of the, all of the Far East. They want to dominate just like Japan wanted to before World War II. Their goal was to dominate that part of the world today because there has been no political reform in Beijing. These guys want to dominate a huge chunk of the planet. Twilight struggle. Andrew Krupenovich served on America's National Defense Panel. He's a military strategist and war planner. You've written that airstrikes and naval blockades have a, a role to play in punishing China. You've described the need for sea mines. You've described the need for special forces. U.S. special forces and missiles placed in islands. This sounds like a preparation for war. Um, our, our first president, George Washington, said, if you want peace, prepare for war. And essentially uh, what the United States is doing, again, is responding to provocative behavior uh, on the part of China. And just as we did in the Cold War, the idea was Uh, to have a position of military strength such that your adversaries were not tempted to act uh, in aggressive ways or try and employ coercion to get their way. I mean, just last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer into the Mm -hmm. Spratly Islands and South China Sea. And what was different about this, I think, was that Chinese fighters scrambled. That sounds like an escalator. Well, the, uh, again, from an American perspective, the, the escalation was the Chinese beginning to militarize these islands in the first place, uh, moving uh, its military capabilities down into that region, uh, engaging in provocative behavior against uh, the commercial activities and, and military um, forces of, of other minor countries in the region that have claim to those islands. Mm-hmm. So it's a response to Chinese intimidation. Uh, rather, how, uh, excuse me. How how is commerce being intimidated in the South China Sea? There have been no military mm-hmm. forces, no military bases there. Uh, the Chinese, except the United States military base, not in the South China Sea, and not in, even in the Philippines, in, in, because the United States withdrew its forces in the Philippines. But the United States is back in the Philippines. Unintentional satire. Yeah, well, there is satire. Kropenovich is a, a great satirical figure. He's much more. He's much more important than he appears there. He was a nuclear war planner, um, and uh, uh, his own political views uh, are quite extreme. Yeah. Um, I, t- I thought it was interesting how much denial you had and obfuscation um, about yeah. the, the bases, um, the presence of bases. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, there are... There are something up to, well, divine estimates, probably up over over a thousand all over the world. Uh, 
But here in Australia, it's absolutely littered with them. The Marines are now all over northern Australia, and uh, and they have this uh, this facade that they're really uh, Australian-run bases. The same thing is true in the UK. They're all Royal Air Force bases, but they're absolutely full of uh, B-52s um, and U.S. Air Force uh, personnel. So they are, in effect, American bases. American bases everywhere. There are 400 American bases now effectively circling China from, from here in Australia up through the Pacific through uh, uh, the Philippines, up through uh, Korea, Japan, uh, and uh, in places like Okinawa and, and Jeju Island, uh, they're you know within four to five hundred miles of the industrial heartland of China. Meanwhile, American ships, low draft ships, uh, shallow draft ships. Uh, are uh, every day testing the uh, the Chinese will to see them off out of Chinese waters. Provocation constantly over and over again. It's of all, I would think, of all the news we talked earlier about news and what isn't broadcast, what isn't told, that is the most important news. The constant daily provocation of China by the United States, and now, of course, they throw in here. There's been a, uh, a an arrangement scheme. Of course, the Australians will pay for it. It's something like three hundred billion dollars uh, to take uh, American nuclear submarines. It's a very complicated arrangement. Some some of them are going to be built in the UK. So the UK is discovering, rediscovering its empire all over again, and it it's so it's so counter to the way the world is and the way the world should be going that um, uh, I sort of hope, and I suppose hope is the word that 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 people will reject it for what it is a farce. Well. I thought we could show another clip so we don't lose uh, track of what the stakes are here. And in another part of this documentary, you are interviewing a scientist and he talks about what's at stake. Yeah. Oh. The scientific studies that I teach by the scientists that predict that the earth can be made essentially uninhabitable from nuclear war, the scientists have been begging the Obama administration. Well, they wouldn't say begging, but they've made multiple requests to meet with them, discuss these predictions because they're peer-reviewed studies and they've been turned down over and over again. They've been peripherally told that, well, we don't think uh, the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are all that important if the immediate effects of nuclear war don't stop it. But the long-term environmental consequences of nuclear war are liable to wipe out the human race. In one exchange, nuclear exchange between the US and China, what could be the consequences? Well, let me just give you an example of what one Chinese four or five megaton warhead would do to a city in the United States. If it got through, uh, the detonation of that weapon over a city would instantly ignite about six or 700 square miles on fire. And, and within 20 to 30 minutes, all of those fires would coalesce into a single gigantic firestorm. There would be no escape from it. So all the people there would perish. So the U.S. with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons on Chinese cities. Well, when you combine all the smoke from these nuclear weapons detonating, it actually creates millions of tons of smoke, black carbon smoke, will rise above cloud level into the stratosphere. It's heated by the sun, it acts like a solar collector. And that smoke, because of that, will stay there for 10 years or longer. And what the smoke does is blocks warming sunlight from reaching the surface of the earth. And it becomes so cold, in a matter of just a couple of weeks that will, the temperatures will fall below freezing every day for one to three years. And it will become too cold to grow food crops for at least 10 years or longer. Yeah. 
So yeah. something that people should, I mean, that's, we never hear about this uh, in the news, never hear the con- a real concern about this. In fact, we had people kind of downplaying the risks of nuclear war uh, in order to, I would say, encourage the, the proxy war in Ukraine. Yeah. And it was that, uh, that excellent analyst there, Stephen Starr, I think from the University of Missouri. Uh, another part of the interview, he, he, he talked about the delegations of scientists yeah. who have gone to the White House, the right. Obama White House then, and had just, just haven't got in the door. Um, I mean, it does seem quite remarkable that with everything we know about the effects of nuclear weapons, of, of what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and elsewhere, uh, we're still prepared to almost blithely ignore the evidence that you've just put on the screen. Uh, that's down to the media. The media has a responsibility and that's its silence on this is a shirking of responsibility with two equals. It's like prop- what you refer to as propaganda by omission. Yes. And that's the great, that is the most powerful, the most potent propaganda is by omission. I would think that uh, as we talked at the beginning of the show, when someone's watching the news, what's the first question they should ask? It should be, what's left out? Mm. What's, what, are, what were they not telling us? Uh, and uh, uh, we know from all that, the, the selectivity of the reporting of conflicts, that, as you found, you yourself found out recently of in Palestine, you watch the little that you you do see report from the occupied terrorists what's left out. Uh, but most, most of it is left out. And that is true now of Ukraine, of course. 